An explosion of birds heralds the coming of spring to Alaska's Walrus Islands in Bristol Bay, southernmost haul-out grounds of the massive Pacific walrus. In this walrus sanctuary, permanent residents, elderly survivors of migrations past, set off chain reactions as they fence for choice rocks warmed by the sun. All over the Bering Sea, in the annual spring migration, many thousands of younger bulls and females launch into the strong current now running northward toward the seas of ice, which will help transport them to the rich clam beds of the Arctic. Captain Cousteau, cameraman and crew planned a rendezvous with some of the migrating herds far to the north in the Bering Strait. In contact by walkie-talkie with Calypso, Cousteau divers observe at close range the launching of these mountainous creatures, some weighing up to 3,700 pounds, with tusks often nearly a yard long. At a disadvantage on land, the walrus can merely resort to intimidation. He's at home only in the sea. In search of rich shellfish grounds, the walruses plunge along toward the uncertain fate that lies beyond the protection of this sanctuary. Fast running currents of the Bering Sea give the walruses a free ride northward. In spite of the heavy toll they've paid to whalers and hunters for many years, they have endured. Their ordeal is evoked in an old nursery rhyme. Did you ever see a walrus smile all these many years? Well, yes, I've seen a walrus smile, but it was hidden by his tears. The durability of the walrus is largely due to the natural protection of the vast seas of ice. Philippe Cousteau and divers approaching the Bering Strait en route to St. Lawrence Island look down upon family pods of walruses journeying slowly toward the Arctic on floating ice planes. Here on the ice, after a year's gestation, cows give birth to single calves, an event never observed by man. Safe from killer whales, polar bears, and humans, the walrus population, once reduced to less than 100,000 beings, is now slowly increasing. Destination, the Eskimo village of Gamble, on the storm-lashed rock that is St. Lawrence Island. The men arrive prior to the arrival of the walruses themselves. Knowledge of the walrus in the wild is fragmentary. Storms at sea, unpredictable ice movements, and the cloak of weather conceal their presence. Herds may pass to the Arctic unnoticed. Here it rains or snows almost daily, the early spring temperature hovering around freezing or below. 
Il y a les sacs. C'est ça qui est lourd. The snow cat and snowmobile have replaced the venerable dog sledge on the white horizon. For Frenchmen in protective Eskimo garments, it is an alien frozen world far from home port in sunny Monaco. In the half light of the subarctic sun, shore ice and fresh snow are exhilarating to Presla and Dorado. Out to test their extra thick wetsuits, our duck-footed divers ascend the nearest mound, to the puzzlement of Eskimo observers. <laughs> that afternoon, the entire Calypso crew is invited to a reception by the village of Gamble. In their celebrations, the Eskimos identify closely with the animals and birds that share their harsh domain. The drum, their only instrument, is made of walrus stomach membrane. The Eskimos make total use of the animals they hunt. Dancers, pantomime flying birds and swimming seals. Traditions are kept alive. The Eskimos like horseplay, which is directed particularly to the children. The festivities are concluded with a courtship dance. On St. Lawrence Island, a sunny day is an event, in itself worthy of celebration. A magical white wilderness enraptures Philippe, Bonissi and Dorado on their way to the sea. The walruses have not as yet arrived, but the first flow of sea ice pushes close to shore. Joined by Vernon Sloco, our Eskimo guide, Philippe is anxious to take advantage of the good weather for an exploratory dive but questions the conditions. Can you go out when the, the ice is so close? Uh -huh. You can go out? Over there? Yeah. I mean the boat? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go out right there. No problem. No problem? No problem. Okay, with it's the big ice? Yeah. Oh, you can board, we can go. The ice like that. No problem? No problem. Yeah. Maneuvering a skin boat through treacherous cross currents of jagged shore ice may be no problem to a hardy Eskimo guide in his own element, but to Calypso divers it can be a chilling experience. For Calypso divers, there are no cranes or winches here. A wooden vessel would break up under the punishment, but the pliable umiak, made with split walrus skins, makes launching through the churning ice possible. Open water is reached at last. 
And the outboard motor replaces manpower with horsepower. Animals of black-eyed beauty are sighted on the ice swells. They are bearded seals sunning themselves. The work at hand is to explore the bottom of the bearing platform. Here, walruses have been known to feed during previous migrations. In preparation for their first grueling dive beneath a moving sea of ice, the men wear double wetsuits. The coldness of Philippe's underwater camera will increase the chance of malfunction. Regulators will deliver ice-cold air to divers' lungs. The lens of the camera is cooled to ambient temperature to avoid fogging from condensation. This is the kind of dive no one wishes to repeat. Calypso divers have visited many strange undersea reaches, but none so eerie and forbidding as this slowly moving cavern of ice. We encounter an arctic jellyfish, tentacles trailing. The almost immobile Medusa is at the mercy of the sea flow and is carried northward by the cold current. Preslin inspects a solid ceiling of ice where bubbles from our air tanks are trapped. One hundred feet below, our divers prepare to rake the sea floor, as some scientists believe feeding walruses do, using their tusks to turn over shellfish. Empty shells are found, left by previous walrus migrations. The walruses are bottom feeders. They consume great quantities of snails, cockles, and clams, their favorite delicacy. A swift current carries our divers over the foraging grounds. Walruses have been known to swallow small stones, perhaps to relieve hunger pangs on their long migrations. The scorpion fish and fish in general are not on their diet. Walruses do not feel the cold but our freezing divers are forced to ascend. They are careful to avoid being crushed by converging ice packs. The divers swim toward surface light. They follow along the pressure ridge, which should eventually lead to open sea. Bonacy and Dorado are the first to surface. 
followed by Philippe Cousteau. It has been a punishing dive in water below 28 degrees. They are impatient to be out of this wintry sea of unbelievable discomfort. Ivan needs help. So swollen by the cold, he can barely move. Okay. Non, pas Freezing waters have temporarily aged once youthful faces. The divers now know why Eskimos never swim. Winds up to 100 miles an hour are not an uncommon phenomenon in the village of Gamble. Even for insulated puppies and work dogs, blizzards are a difficult fact of everyday life. Through long, bitter storms, for snowbound Eskimos, there is ivory to be carved to traditional songs. Seated upon the floor, the carver works at his trade, while his wife sews a raincoat made of stretched walrus entrails. The carver's wife was tattooed when she became a bride. The traditional song becomes a singing commercial as the artisan appeals to cities and states where he hopes to sell his carvings. It's carving song, Topeka. Topeka? Yeah, San Francisco. I carving for skates, all these skates. I see. Order me some carving. You see me now. Work long time. Raw ivory can no longer be exported, but must be carved, enhancing its value and providing employment when joblessness here approaches 90% in the winter. In this barren land, the walrus has always been, almost exclusively, the determinant of the Eskimos' existence. But with the coming of the whalers came decades of wholesale slaughter for oil and skins for foreign markets. Then came the headhunters, robbing adult walruses of their tusks for ivory chess figures and luxury ornaments. Finally, the harpoon gave way to the musket. Herds were thinned until, for the protection of the walruses, regulative laws were passed. Now, in legal harvesting, descendants of primitive food gatherers take to their skin boats. If the Eskimos can locate the scattered herds, a legal quota will be taken to restore the village's meat supply and provide the necessities for subsistence. The 
walruses have arrived. They are funneling through the 45 mile Bering Strait between the mountains of Siberia and St. Lawrence Island on their free ride north. With the arrival of Captain Cousteau on snow-swept gamble, the skin boat of Vernon, the Eskimo guide, is skidded to the water's edge. Cousteau and the Calypso team will take advantage of a short break in a relentless series of spring storms to search out and study the walruses, now drifting north through the narrows of the Bering Strait. We leave the pristine beauty of the shore for a rendezvous through ice-studded seas. This is my first experience with a world of blinding purity, where sky and sea are indistinguishable. Vernon, there's a seal over there. As we approach, the seal shyly retreats. Nearby, still another seeks the protection of the sea. Upon lowering a hydrophone, we hear an amazing world of sounds. Although we have seen but two seals, hundreds are heard singing. It is a symphony reverberating between the seafloor and the ceiling of ice. <laughs> It may be that, like ultra-modern frequency modulation sonar, these continuous songs are used to measure distances. But birds often sing to express the joy of life, so why not seals? All day, Cousteau and his party push through the vast ice fields without sighting a single walrus. 20 miles from Siberia, they cross the international dateline and suddenly a distant sleeping herd. We silently approach upwind, for smell is the walrus's most developed sense. Yet it is not the smell of man that creates fear of man. Their concern would depend upon a past unhappy experience with man. One of the walruses, perhaps a sentinel, raises his tusks, probably as a threat to us, while his companions go back to sleep. Vanguard of the migration from Russian shores, they have perhaps never seen humans before. The group is composed of four adult males and a four-year-old younger male. Out of the water, walruses, like most sea mammals, are lazy, contented creatures. Their awareness is dulled by sleepiness, but their hearing is acute. And as we prepare to record their sounds, we inadvertently destroy the tranquil scene. <coughs> On the ice floor, the largest male stands fast, bold and defiant. <coughs> Mm. 
The walrus society is closely knit. They never desert a companion. Mm -hmm. Aggressive bulls have been known to rip skin boats from beneath. The animals now approach us in a threatening test display. The big male bellows his contempt. As he fearlessly settles down, it provides us with a rare opportunity to film him at close range and record his sounds. Philippe and I are cautious. Approaching a walrus on level ice may be dangerous, for when provoked, these two-ton creatures can strike with surprising speed. Our presence first draws an inquiring look, and then the ruler of the ice floe mm. appears overwhelmed mm. by the burden of unexpected guests. I venture closer. The other walruses move toward their companion. The recording of the animal has become a confrontation of wills. The younger bull moves in to urge the old one to leave. Suddenly, from the young walrus comes an incredible bell sound. It is a call of alarm, produced from two air sacs on either side of his neck. Nobly defiant to the last, the reluctant bull rejoins his herd. Voracious gulls in the strait indicate that hunters have also found walruses. Some Eskimos return a piece of hide and blubber to the sea as an offering of gratitude for the rich meat they will store in earthen cellars. In the distance, another walrus herd. Cousteau observes the approach of the hunters. Man has always, and will always need, to kill for eating. But one cannot help having mixed emotions when suddenly confronted by the reality of a hunt, especially when the hunter's stealth and skill of old have been augmented by outboard motors, walkie-talkies, and high-powered binoculars. During the brief six-week migration, because of severe storms, the Eskimos average only one day of hunting out of every three. Old males will be passed, juveniles spared. Prime targets are the females, who place themselves between the boat and their babies. Female skins, undamaged by fighting, are needed for the Eskimos' boats. An orphaned pup calls for its mother. His mother has expired on an ice floe.
Only four days ago, she had cut her calf's umbilical cord, and together they had headed northward on their great adventure. Infant walrus, who will stem your tears. The orphaned baby walrus, unafraid of man, swims toward Cousteau's approaching boat. The cub has left its dead mother to attach itself to any living thing. Alone, the 125-pound cub could not survive in the Arctic Sea. The baby walrus will receive the trained attention of Ed Asper, assistant curator of mammals at Marineland of the Pacific. As a little one climbs around from person to person, we are moved by the infant's pressing need for touch and affection. He has found companions to whom he can transfer the trust he felt for his mother. The weather closes in, and so do our thoughts. The need for hunting walruses is discussed with John Apongaluk of the City Council of Gamble, Lee Kuzata of the Eskimo IRA Council, and Alaska's Walter J. Hickel, former U.S. Secretary of the Interior. How many walrus does it take on an average for a, a community like Gamble, which is about 400? How many walrus a, a year? 350 a 350 year. Just about, not quite one per person. No. No. Two years we have no luck at all. And first year out of those five years, I think if I do remember right, there is only one walrus killed by one boat by luck. Just one. And then the uh, second year, there are very, very few. During those two years, a man with a big family whose uh, income is only by carving. We didn't get in. Yeah. Well, that's why it's important that it is important yeah. that the walrus is yeah. your livelihood. Myself, yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, really uh, traveling around the world and having been involved in government, mm -hmm. I think the people that live in the Arctic, especially the, the Eskimo, know more about conservation and use of animals, the yeah. total. Mm -hmm. They waste less than any place I've ever that's seen. right. Because <coughs> The weather makes the problem difficult. <coughs> now, John, what, what do you use for the keel of your boats? Uh, we use uh, ivory, too, the tusk. From uh, uh, the male. Male, yeah. Because they uh, slide easy. We uh, are suitable for any kind of uh, surface on the ice. In other words, you need we need the whole thing. Whole have thing to have it all. Yeah, as to where it's going now. I agree yeah. with you totally. Yeah. That's the wisest use of sea mammal for humanity. And I, mm -hmm. what we have to do is manage it so the human is cared for, and the walrus is cared. For. Right. Yeah. No walrus was ever cared for with more devotion than the orphan pup. He's nicknamed Burke by our divers because of his throaty barks. Ed Asper explains how, in the wild, the baby walrus is kept clean by his mother. She washes him in the water or rolls him in the snow. But the water, the snow, uh, after we wash him here, we rub him with snow and dries him, cleans him very well. Cleans him almost better than water. <laughs> With his bouquet of bristles, which are sensitive tactile organs, the curious infant learns about the world around him, including the lens of our camera. As with the human baby, the bath is followed by the bottle. 
Until recently, it was difficult to keep rescued calves alive. But scientists have been able to approximate the walrus mother's milk. The formula consists of clams, cream, corn oil, salt, calcium, and vitamins. He's capable right now of consuming a half a gallon in one feeding. Yeah, that's pretty fast. It'd go a little faster if you squeeze on the bottle, but uh, I don't like to rush it too much. Get up here. He's getting hooked on my finger. Charlie's enjoying it because he keeps closing his eyes momentarily. He goes into little dreams, I think. How nice and is warm it is. Is that a sign? I think so. I think walrus do dream. When he sleeps, he twitches and, you know. And you'll probably hear him suck air in just a minute. Yeah. Okay, he knows it's gone. Yeah. Take a little snow, I think, and wash his channel off. Yeah. I don't know Yeah. Yeah. Not such a good idea. He doesn't like that. <laughs> Not wishing to be left alone, Burke follows. Still a little uncertain about his new surroundings, he reaches out for food and affection with his inquiring bristles. Through ages of evolution, his fore and hind limbs have been modified into flippers. Burke is a pinniped. As he waddles on, we see the swiveling of his wing-footed hind feet that enables him to walk. Tomorrow, his surrogate mothers will give him his first diving lesson. It is another bone-chilling day in the subpolar regions of the Bering Strait. Walrus pups are not born with a natural liking for the water, but learn to swim under the tutelage of their mothers. Since Burke has lost his mother, who would have taught him to breathe underwater, the Calypso divers must once again serve as mother's substitutes and once more brave the frigid sea. Burke's baby blubber makes him almost impervious to cold, but he has to be tenderly coaxed into the water. Confused, Burke expels air and gulps water. He has not yet learned to breathe properly and to close his watertight nostrils before submerging. Adult walruses can spend 10 minutes underwater. Burke keeps constantly popping up to breathe. He swims around, bowling like a little kid, holding his head out of water. Our frightened baby seeks security by riding on Bonissi's back as he might his mother's. With his flippers, he seizes the diver's arm and is carried downward, only to escape upward once more. It is a woeful experience that he is beginning to learn. And assisted by Preslin, descends at last all the way to the sea floor. Although he stays under for only a few seconds, now he has the confidence to try it on his own.
Kirk is praised for his good work and then surprises us by actually searching the bottom for food during this, his first diving lesson. Much of his information is transmitted through his whiskers. Ascending with confidence, Burke is a big boy now. Ah, ça va mieux maintenant, hein? Burke, Burke, Burke! Burke, 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 Burke! Allez, viens nager avec nous. Oui, ça For Presley, his teacher, whiskery kisses. Burke, Burke, Burke. Oui, tu es gentil. The spring thaw sets in. Ice slips away to the sea, and the once snowy shore becomes pebbled. Once, these Eskimo elders had also taken to the skin boats. Now, no longer able to hunt, at the end of the season they sit and look, and recall the brave days of their youth with the walrus. The hunt has averaged one walrus per Eskimo household. This ice flow is still black with animals as they prepare to abandon the diminishing drift ice on their way north from St. Lawrence Island. Captain Cousteau observes the large family pod of inquisitive juveniles, bulls and cows now in passage to the remote clamshells of the Chukchi Sea. The walruses will no longer travel on ice, but they will take full advantage of the strong currents that will help carry them northward. The Eskimos of Gamble celebrate the conclusion of a successful hunting season. An inexperienced visiting Frenchman, Louis Preslin, joins in the traditional blanket toss. In our age of advanced technology, in this Eskimo village, tribal traditions are kept alive. But does the preservation of a native culture conflict with progress and with enlightened conservational thought? Walter Hickel. I think that uh, uh, the most important thing as I see it is we allow them to have their life the way they need it. They have to live with life in the sea. And uh, I think that uh, we have an obligation to see to it that that life is protected. And yet we can't protect it to the point to where they can't use it. See. In open waters, far beyond St. Lawrence Island, we follow a walrus family on its way northward. Soon, all contact with them will be lost as they disperse to seek out shellfish banks reaching to the polar ice cap. Today, Russian and American aerial surveys indicate that the population of the Pacific walrus has slowly increased to approximately 150,000. Walrus, Behind your bristling whiskers, do you smile? <laughs> On St. Lawrence Island, hit by unprecedented bad weather, Burke is left behind. But the orphaned walrus is not alone. Through 12 inches of newly dropped snow, Louis Preslin and the animal walk to the sea for a farewell swim. Soon, Burke will travel, not northward, but to Southern California's marine land of the Pacific, where he will be cared for by Ed Asper in the company of other Arctic mammals. Oui, on est copains maintenant, hein? Allez, viens. For the diver who taught him to swim underwater, the affectionate pup wears his heart on his flipper. Pup rides on Preslin's back 
as he would his mother's during migration. With his great flippers, he grasps Preslin's arm tightly and nuzzles confidently, totally unaware that these are the last moments together before parting. We had come to study the animal first described by Norsemen a thousand years ago as an ugly, fearsome monster with blazing red eyes. Red eyes they may have, but we have met and taken to our hearts a tender, responsive creature. We have found that, yes, if you return his natural affection, you may see a walrus smile. Far south of the Bering Strait, at Alaska's Round Island, resident old males who no longer migrate live their life of leisure on retirement rocks. Pale blue from a long dive, an elderly bull seeks the warmth of his rosy sunbaked brothers. In this sanctuary, near Calypso at anchor, protected walruses dive and feed unafraid. Our thoughts are with the walrus, past and present. With our management and our constant surveillance, the walrus society would appear secure. Yet it has been the walrus's seasonal retreat to inaccessible seas of ice for breeding and calving that has largely preserved them from jeopardy. Until now, more than any other sea mammal, and perhaps more than man himself, the walrus has been in command of his own life, his own destiny.